Let me ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 39. The title of tonight's, today's message is Shut My Mouth. Um, and I also have to make a little bit of a confession. I, I got ahead in writing messages for Psalms, and at one point I was about four weeks ahead, and uh, I didn't keep up with that as well as I probably should have because I preached the message out of order, which means that we looked at part of Psalm 39 last week, and so I'm going to preach that one again next week. No, no, I'm not going to do that. So we're going to back up and look at Psalm 39, the first couple of verses. Now, ever so often, um, I deliver a message and I kind of hide that uh, it's about me. Well, this morning, uh, if, it, if it applies to you, God bless you. Uh, but understand that this message was written, in all honesty, uh, with the Holy Spirit using me as a punching bag. Because this is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult thing, that any of us have to do. So let's look at Psalm chapter 39, and let's read only verse 1. David writes, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. There it is. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. And in looking at this, I realized that in Psalm 39, David begins with two interesting words. I said. And what David is doing in writing this psalm is he's making a declaration. It's a res resolution, if you would like, a decision where he is deciding to honor God more than he has in the past. David's greatest fear was to sin against God. And so to avoid sin, think about this, he had to start with what he said. That's where he had to begin. And so I began thinking about myself, and I realized that for me to avoid sin, that I have to navigate every day, hour, and minute consciously. Have you ever noticed how slippery the tongue is and how easy it is to just say something, just and there it is? Well, David is realizing this. I'm realizing that. And it tells me something very important about my own walk with Christ and my level of maturation. Is that a word? It tells me how much I'm maturing. Let's say it that way. That works a lot better. Um, because I can monitor my progress in becoming more like Christ out of what I say. Because the scripture says, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever's in my heart is going to come out my mouth, uh, including when you stump your toe. Hello? Yeah, you know, I've got that one. That's one time, I'm not going to tell the story, but there was one time my whole family, my whole family laughed at me because I stumped my toe so bad. We were moving in here, Muscle I'm, I guess I'm telling the story. <laughs> we were moving the, the, into Muscle Shoals, and at that time we were staying temporarily in a little apartment, and of course we have this uh, treadmill and, and those things are gangly and kind of big and you know, they're, it's, they're hard. So I told, I told the family, I said, y'all get back there and push and I'll get in the front and I'll pull without shoes on. So we're pulling and, and I get, and it gets to the point where, where I was, I mean, I was Herculean, I was doing it and I was pulling and that, that treadmill went just over my foot enough to catch my right big toenail. And I said something. And my whole family laughed. They didn't say, Dad, are you okay? Is everything all right? I mean, I'm writhing in pain on the floor and they're giggling. And I finally, once I re returned to normalcy, I said, why are we all laughing? They said, we've never heard you that say that before. So 
in one way that was good because they were in their teens, you know, but anyway, you can tell the condition of your heart. And I have another story, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, I have another story that, that I, uh, I'm not going to, let me get to back to the message in the scripture. Is that okay? Can I do that? All right. Let me give you a quote here. It is better to be silent and thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. I would give you a reference for that in the Bible, but it's not from the scripture, but it's true nonetheless. However, the scripture is a lot more blunt. I ran into Proverbs chapter 18 and verse six. It says, a fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Yesterday, I saw the perfect example of this. You know, we're, I'm doing softball. And apparently, the coach thought I made a bad call, which I was absolutely amazed that I would do such. And he not only disagreed with me, but he ran out on the field pointing, yelling, screaming, once no cussing, but that I had never had a coach be so frustrated that his mouth just, just became a cacophony of, of angry vitriol. Those are words that I read this week, okay? And, and so I, I go back at him and I yelled, coach, you're restricted to the dugout, which I've never done before. And then an inning or two later, he came up to me and says, Blue, that's what they call official. He said, Blue, I don't know what happened to me. He said, I apologize. I'm sorry. Can I please come back and be on first base? Actually, he didn't say that. He just did it. And I told him, and he, but he did. He apologized. He said, I'm sorry. Went through all that. And I realized that's how quick it can happen over something as simple as a girl's softball game. And how careful we have to be because something can transpire that in the big scheme of life is nothing. And it just flows out of our mouth. Scripture says a fool's lips walk into a fight in his mouth in fights of beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips a snare to his soul. I started running into a problem with the message right here because of what I was reading and how I was evaluating. Don't turn to these passages. Write them down if you would like. Because I remember James chapter 3 and verse 2. Listen to this. We all, what does the number, what does the word all mean? Include everybody, right? Y'all, me, all of us. We all stumble in many ways. I should have stopped right there and I didn't. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Then I got to verse 8. You know, are there times where you wish you would just, you ought to just stop on a verse and not go to the next one? Well, this is one. No human being can tame the tongue. Did y'all hear that? No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. It's like James said, okay, I've got the pulpit. I'm going to throw myself a fit. James 1.26. If anyone thinks he is religious, listen to it. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. I felt like I was digging myself into a hole by reading scripture, but it's called conviction. Jesus says in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
Now, I had a problem with these. Have you ever read the Bible and not liked what you were reading? Have you ever read the Bible and thought, ooh, that one hurts? Have you ever gotten into the scripture and would have preferred that they would have just left that one out? Well, I was having struggles with this because it was hitting home. It was hitting home. Just, just, just listen. James said, no human can tame the tongue. That's me. That's me. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And then I, I mean, take another look here at James. If a person doesn't bridle their tongue, their religion is worthless. Well, then who all does that include? It's all of us. You know, the first rule of holes is when you're in one, quit digging. Well, I should have kept quit digging because I was reading and I was feeling very convicted. And I was wondering, okay, does that mean, Ron, that your religion, your faith, your Christianity is worthless? I, saw, I mean, do you, you see my struggle here that I was getting into? Well, then I went to Ephesians 3, 4, 29, where Paul, Paul's a little bit softer, a little bit more pastorly. But here's what's written in Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk. Keep those two words in your mind. We're going to come back to them. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. At least, at least Paul comes out with some, okay, don't do this, do this. Now, I, I, can, I can work with that because that gives me, gives me some, some um, opportunities. So here, here's what I did. Now, this is how, you remember I've, I've mentioned to you that one of the things I want to do as your pastor is to help you understand and be able and capable to study and learn the scriptures yourself. Not to just buzz through passages and, and look at them, but, but to actually try to pull them apart and, and ask the Holy Spirit to, to uh, apply it. So here's what I did. When I read these verses, here's what I knew I had to do. I had to define, biblically now, biblically, corrupting talk, an untamed tongue, and what bridling the tongue means. Because, again, as I was reading this, it seems that no one can do it, Christians included, can control the tongue. And if that's the case, James 126 kicks me in the head and my faith is worthless. But I know that's not the case. I am saved. I am a believer. So how do I reconcile these hardline, evangelistic, old-time gospel preaching with those of us who are trying to, to grapple with the truth in the scriptures itself. Because a, a, a tame tongue and bridling the tongue point to controlling what I say. And yet James says no one can control the tongue. So I'm, I'm struggling here. The problem is that it seems doing either or both is actually impossible. And not only that, Failing at those seems to signal an unsafe condition. That's where I was struggling. So here's what I came up with in prayer, Bible study, reflecting, talking to a, a friend or two. Let me tell you what I think corrupting talk is. It's taking God's name in vain and castigating the Christian faith. Those are the top level for me. Okay. Number two is gossip. And then what I mean by gossip is that it's the kind of talk that denigrates the good name of others or destroys their character. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's truth. Just because something is true does not mean I need to tell. It. Amen. Because we don't want people telling others the truth about us. Hello? That one should have got a bigger amen. Third would be cursing. You know what those are. F-bombs, go through all of it. So what my granny called having a potty mouth. 
And the last is this, speaking lies and deception on anything with anyone else. Do you hear that? Speaking lies and deception with others. Is it possible to do that without saying a word? Yes. Yes. You know, we can, with a, a raising of an eyebrow, you know, a wink of, well, what I've been told on good sources, you know, it, in other words, we've got to be careful. We've got to understand what are we doing? What is our real motivation? What is coming from out of our heart? Even when we don't say things, my mom, she's not here today, could look at me and say a bunch of words. Like, boy, you better not. All, all she had to do was look. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can do the same thing. Speaking lies and deception on anything about any person, let me say this. Now, this is going to be a hard line. We are never more like Satan than when we speak lies and deception. That comes from John chapter 8 and verse 44, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And here's what he said. Now, what Jesus said is hard, but it's true. He's the Son of God. He didn't sin. He says, you, now think about this. He is, he is in these guys' presence. He's not talking behind their back. He's nailing them between the eyes. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Now also remember, these were the most religious people in Israel in that time. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, let's slow down. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of all lies. So whenever we lie or deceive, guess who we're imitating? Our adversary. Now, okay, I had my definitions settled. I had those in front of me. Now I had to work through them. I had to reconcile some scriptures that seemed to be contradicting others in how I felt. And so what I did is I, I had to work and, and to make sure that I was being honest and faithful to the words of God regardless of what they were. And here's what I came up with. Number one, number one. When a person is saved, they are saved through and through. That they are not. Don't you always hate it when people follow a statement with but? Well, but we are not immediately and completely transformed to what we will be in heaven. Instead, we begin a process that takes time. And you know how long that process is? It's the rest of your life. And the Holy Spirit works in us to make us more and more like Jesus. And so it becomes a matter of the heart. Number two. But this is a big one. A person who is genuinely saved. I'm putting that, that word in there. Genuinely saved cannot emphasize, cannot transgress God's law without the Holy Spirit convicting them. A Christian cannot sin and transgress God's laws and feel fine with it. The Holy Spirit will convict them. And the Holy Spirit will move us to fight against sin in whatever form. For today, we're talking about our words, the abundance of our heart. It is impossible for a believer to sin and the Spirit not to convict them. And the reason is because of what you have read and I have quoted many times before. I'm not going to quote it today, but write it down. Go read it again till you memorize it. It's Philippians 1, 6, 2, 13 with Romans 8, 29. He is at work in us to conform us to the image of Christ. Now, here's something I ran into that is interesting. So, right for the past, past couple of minutes, we've talked about believers. But did you know unbelievers 
actually do have a, a smidgen of the same thing in them. But what we find, let me read this for you, that, that they, they have a, a law unto themselves even though they haven't been saved. It is God implants that in them. This comes from Romans 1.19. It says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. They are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. People who are unsaved know the difference between right and wrong. I mean, they even, there are people who are not believers that make our laws and they do it on a moral basis. And guess where that moral basis comes from? Scripture. Uh, ultimately, the Scripture. Romans 2.14. I, I, this one's really good. Paul writes, when Gentiles, those are people who are not saved, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written in their hearts while their consciences also bears witness. Now, the point is this. Because a believer's desire is to be more like Christ, they know the condition of their heart must continue to be improved. We call that sanctification, becoming more like Christ. And they know that that is exposed by what they say. So if our heart strays and is shown in what we say, and the awareness of straying happens by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. See, that's the thing about it. Being a Christian is not easy and it's not always fun in fact there are a lot of times where it's just downright not fun at all and it's because the holy spirit is convicting us of stuff that we know that we ought not be doing but we've been ignoring him and he's not going to let us get away with it because in the, the romans 8 29 that p word you remember that p word in romans 8 29 predestined that word predestined in romans 8 29 is all about being conformed to the image of christ and that's what god is going to do with every single believer. Now let's go back to Psalm 39. Now I'm ready to, if you're tired, okay, it's 1139, I'm starting the message now. All that was introduction. Psalm 39. I will guard my ways, but I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my, half, half, my, my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. Now that, that's, that just kind of, why, why, what does that matter? As long as the wicked are in my presence. If we talk the same way the unsaved do, they look at us and go, you know, apparently Jesus doesn't mean a whole lot to them. You know, they gossip as much as anybody else. They have a potty mouth just like I do. You know, it does make a difference when we are in their presence to not do what they do. They would have no reason to think we're any different from them. And that, that uh, casts dispersion on the name of Christ and God. And we are supposed to be his representatives, his ambassadors. So does it matter what I say and how I say it? Yes. Romans 14, 21. It is good, Paul writes, not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. You know, he could have let that part out if he wanted to. Because when he says do anything that causes your brother to stumble, that includes what we say. That includes my speech. It includes how I interact with others. It, it, it matters when I am in a group. Let's say I'm in a group of three or four people and, and they're, they're really chopping somebody up. I mean, they are doing it. And sometimes I have to be, look, it is difficult not to join in. But the better thing is to say, 
How about them brakes? You know, change the subject. Or intervene and say, guys, we don't need to be talking about him. And then there's an, here's another one. You can use this one later. I wonder how y'all talk about me when I'm not around. Or I wonder how everybody else talks about everybody else when everybody else isn't around. We have to be different because of the work of Christ in us. Now, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, tricked you on that one. Now, I, I got to thinking, and I found all kind of pithy little quotes and stuff that I could... I could give you, and y'all think, boy, he, he really knows his stuff. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to read one, two, three, four scriptures straight out, maybe make one sentence of a, of a comment, and then we'll be done. Can I give her an amen? Yeah, okay. Psalm 141.3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and keep watch over the door of my lips. You know what that is? called prayer it's called prayer we need to pray and ask God to help us Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19 have y'all ever known about somebody that's just a just talk all the time you can't get them to shut up okay can't believe y'all would say that about somebody when words are many Proverbs 10 19 when words are many Transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Here's what that means. It's better sometimes just to be silent. We've already mentioned this one before, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead... Let there be thanksgiving. And I like this verse for this reason. If you tell somebody don't do X, it's harder than if you say don't do X, but do Y. In other words, replace it with something. And that's what he's saying here in, in Ephesians 5, 4, um, is to replace that fil filthiness and foolish talk, talk and joking with thanksgiving. That's a good thought. And then the last one, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech always be, and the word there means keep on being. So it's a double emphasis, always keep on being gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That takes a lot of work. But there I, and I, this was my last one. You know this verse. You have it memorized. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. And there you go. Through Christ. Who strengthens me? So should we care what we say? Just watch yourself. Or, or let's do this. Let's do this. Are you working out of town this week, Pam? You're not? I don't want her around me doing what I'm about to tell y'all y'all need to do. So now, ask somebody that is close to you to help you. And whenever you slip, have a slip of the tongue, let them go. That's one. That's two. I can't, I've got to say it. I have got, I'm sorry. <laughs> the mother and daughter, the daughter went, you know, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit's in the midst of that one, okay? You know? but, but ask somebody to help us because, guys, we need help. We need it. You know, if we're just out there by ourselves, it, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. So let's, let's conclude our time here today and, and maybe even go on YouTube and watch this again because you, you've missed something. And try to, to say, God, help me. That's probably the best place to start. God, help me. Let's pray. Father, God, help me. That the condition of my heart, the abundance of my heart, would be evident through my speech better and better, more and more each day. 
that I would consistently battle the adversary who would put stumbling blocks in my way to try and get me to fall. For indeed, Father, one of the worst things I can do is that through my speech cause someone to stumble, as a result, stumble away from the faith in you. And so I ask for your power, your strength, in an ongoing fashion and manner, with the help of our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we may do better and better and better with controlling our tongue, as David wrote in Psalm chapter 39. God, now may this time of, of invitation be according to your will and in, in your moving. In Christ's name, amen. Joel, what number we got? 420. 420. Let's all stand together. <coughs> Thank <coughs> you.